Hello, and welcome to Lesson 7, which I've titled The Sensational and the Spiritual. It may seem like kind of an odd title, whereas most of our other titles have clearly delineated a genre or time period or culture or specific type of literature. Uh, but as we continue our discussion of the Renaissance, I've intentionally... Um, place together two texts, or rather one text and one set of texts here that encapsulate what seem to be two very uh, different categories, the sensational and the spiritual. And my reason for doing that is to show how both of these things were very important during the Renaissance. The sensational text we'll look at today in this lesson, Orlando Furioso, um, by the Italian poet Ludovico Oristo is very sensational, um, filled with all kinds of scandalous things, not the type of text you would have seen in the Middle Ages. So it really illustrates the progression, the change in style of literature from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. <clears throat> the other text, or rather set of texts, come from the section of the textbook titled God, Church, and Self, and these are texts that were born out of the Protestant Reformation which occurred during the Renaissance period. And we've already talked about the Protestant Re Reformation in the previous lesson when we begin our discussion of the Renaissance and that introduction. Um, but the Protestant Reformation was one of the most influential movements in European or really Western history, not just the Renaissance, but all of European Western history in terms of the significance of the changes which it caused. <clears throat> so we, we definitely need to look at those texts at some point, and I've very intentionally paired them with Orlando Furioso, even though they're so different from Orlando Furioso, um, because it shows, because doing so shows the wide variety of texts produced during the Renaissance, in that even as, as we've talked about, they moved away from focusing on the spiritual and focusing on more earthly things compared to the Middle Ages, which is illustrated by Orlando Furioso, that religion, spirituality were still very important concerns. Um, they just manifested in a very different way than um, the Middle Ages. So <clears throat> we'll get to look at these two extremes and see how both types of text encapsulate Renaissance themes and values. That's the purpose of this lesson. So we'll start with the more scandalous texts, Orlando Furioso. <coughs> and for recall, I ask you, to take a minute um, and try to recall the themes and values of the Renaissance. So pause the lesson and take a minute and think about those. Um, once you've unpaused it, I'll go on and you know kind of give you my overview of those. As I just mentioned, a shift with the rise of humanism, a shift from focusing on the afterlife and focusing more on what happens during human lifespan. So a focus on more earthly things, more immediate things in the moment. Um, obviously the rise of humanism. Uh, with that, a uh, focus on the individual individuality and to go along with that, a focus on psychology and interiority. So more of what was going on in someone's mind and more focus on the individual rather than the nation, whereas the nation, as we saw, was very important during the Middle Ages. Um, now also think about how these themes and values have appeared in the text we've already studied. Um, so you pause it, take note of that, but when you unpause it, you'll hear me say that um, with the Renaissance love sonnets, we saw that psychology, that interiority, as the speaker talked about his beloved or her beloved, and that revealed the male or female speaker's thoughts, their state of mind. And we've also seen this focus on the individual and the human, with Machiavelli's The Prince, that you know emphasizes um, <clears throat> what a good ruler should be. And although we've seen some earlier examples of the mirror of prince's genre, such as <clears throat> the Shamana. Mainly, that genre really emerged as part of the Renaissance because that focused on what a good leader should be and um, 
the individual emphasis of that, um, as opposed to just pledging allegiance to the ruler as part of chivalry in the Middle Ages, was such a Renaissance type of thing. Um, and also, what determined who a leader is was questioned more, um, which we'll see as part of the Protestant Reformation, that line of questioning emerges. Um, so, keep these themes and values in mind, and try to consider how they appear in both Orlando Furioso as well as the Reformation texts. And we'll return to that as our very last learning question. <coughs> the background in Orlando Furioso is very brief um, because the author Ludovico Aristo, even though he has this really significant contribution of this poem we're about to study, um, not, I mean, it's mainly brief biographies that we're going to go into here. It doesn't go into as much depth. Um, it, I want to say this was a game changer poem in the way that, say, Machiavelli's The Prince was a game changer or the way the Renaissance sonnets were a game changer. But it's still a very influential work that really helps encapsulate the changes from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. That's why we're studying, but the background is much briefer here. Um, so the poem... Uh, Poem follows Orlando, and in parentheses there, that should say Roland, or Roland, not Rolando, um, as he chases the elusive Princess Angelica. So that's the basic plot. Um, he's this knight, and she's this Chinese princess. And this is the same character, theoretically speaking, that we saw in Song of Roland earlier in the quarter. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that was a historical battle that that poem, Song of Roland, depicted. And <clears throat> um, Roland, the hero of it, the protagonist of it, was um, kind of a legendary folk hero. So there have been multiple versions throughout time. Song of Roland from France, which we read earlier in the quarter, is the most famous. And this one, Orlando Furioso, um, by the Italian poet Aristo here, is probably the second most famous version, but there are also other versions. Um, which again shows the influence and the spread of mythology and folklore um, throughout these time periods. Um, and what's interesting about that is Orlando here is such a different type of protagonist than Roland that it really leads to some interesting comparisons and enables us to see how different this text is and how different this portrayal of the Roland figure is it really enables us to see the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Um, as with Song of Roland, the poem is set against the backdrop of Charlemagne's battles against the Saracen Muslims in Spain. Um, but it's much more of a backdrop here than in Song of Roland. The heroes are all, off and off kind of pursuing their own um, goals and desires. Um, a little bit about Aristo himself. Uh, the textbook calls him Renaissance Italy's greatest poet, um, and that may very well be the case, I would say, outside of Petrarch. But in terms of narrative or epic poetry, this would certainly be the prime example for the Renaissance. Obviously, Dante predates that, with Dante representing the Middle Ages. Um, Sorry about that. My computer froze there or something for a minute. Um, and part of what makes uh, Aristo's work here with Orlando Furioso so famous is that it blends genres. It's both comical and epic. It's filled with all these contrasts. So it's sad. It's also funny. And it was very appealing to people for those reasons. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide when we really start looking at the text itself. Aristo himself did not come from a well-off background. He was born into the lower nobility. So he wasn't poor, but he wasn't part of that upper echelon uh, strata of society. Um, so he entered into the service of a prolificate cardinal. Prolificate means a very kind of scandalous figure. Um, but the cardinal was well off enough that he, and he could see 
um, Aristo's poetic skill that he financed the first edition of Orlando Furioso in 1516. But just a year later, he fired Aristo for not going with him on a mission trip to Hungary. Um, so then Aristo entered the service of the more cultured Duke Alfonso, uh, <clears throat> but Alfonso himself did not have much money. He was constantly negotiating with Emperor Charles V, which is the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, to keep the Pope from seizing Ferrar, which is the city-state that um, Aristo and um, Alfonso come from. And so he wasn't able to finance um, Aristo's literary endeavors the way um, the Cardinal, who Aristo previously served, was able to. So... Um, Orlando Furioso wasn't finished. It wasn't a completed work until much later. Um, to try to help Aristo financially, the Duke sent him to a uh, bandit-ridden province. That's the phrase the textbook uses. Um, and he thought managing that province in Italy would help uh, Aristo make some money, but <clears throat> it really didn't. It was a very tough job. Aristo wanted out of that. So about 10 years later, that was 1822, when the Duke sent him there, Aristo was finally able to return to Ferrara, his home city-state, and finish the final completed edition of Orlando Furioso just a year before he died. So just a little bit of brief background there on the author himself. On the next slide where we look at reading questions, we're going to talk about why this work is so significant. <clears throat> so these reading questions address how unique Orlando Furioso is, which is why we're studying it. And um, hopefully you've already tried to answer these as you were reading. Uh, but talking about them now, I think you'll see why this work is so interesting and unique. Um, the first point is that it blends genres. Um, comedy is at the forefront here. This is a, not just a funny text, but, you know, you read it, and I'm sure you had this experience reading it yourself. It's hard to take much of it serious because of the tone, the kind of crazy things that happen. At the same time, they're very sad, very tragic moments. I mean, most of these relationships don't end well. And, and sometimes it's comical when Orlando Furioso is going insane. We, I mean, it's, that's tragic, but we <clears throat> probably ask ourselves, how sympathetic are we supposed to be to this guy? Because his quest to pursue the Princess Angelica was kind of doomed or at least ill-fated from the beginning. Whereas Fior de Spina's love for Bradamante, that seems very tragic. There's a note of sadness, even though um, Richard Dett's seduction of her is very comical. Um, the fact that she doesn't end up with who she really loves, there's much more sadness running through that narrative. So these blending of genres. Um, <clears throat> there's also more to this. This is a sprawling text. It's a very long text. We're reading a very short excerpt. I think the full text is around 500 pages. Um, so be grateful we're not reading that. But um, it's a sprawling text. We are only looking at two narratives here. And these are the two primary ones. But there are other narratives also intertwined. And in addition to spanning genres, it also spans locations. It, you know, it goes all the way to India and China where the events take place in the whole narrative. So it's a sprawling text. So part of the question here is, does it feel cohesive? Do these genres come together well, or is it more of kind of a jumbled mess? Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that, so we'll return to that a little bit later with the reading questions. Um, but really think about, can tragedy and comedy come together? And when they do, what is their effect? What is the message? How is um, Aristo using that blending of tragedy and comedy to convey a specific message? I'm not going to tell you what the message is. I want to hear your thoughts on it. And there's certainly more than one answer there. <clears throat> this second reason this text is very unique is that Aristo likes to take famous heroes from the past, from history or folklore or mythology, that have traditionally been portrayed in a certain way. For instance, before Orlando Furioso, Roland was portrayed, as we saw, um, as very chivalrous, dutiful, loyal to his king, loyal to a fault almost. Um, basically the most loyal example you can have. Um, <clears throat> and that's not just in the Song of Roland, that's typically the way Roland was portrayed in most 
versions of the story before this one. <coughs> I'm sure there are some exceptions, but most of them. So, um, here, instead of being this dutiful, chivalrous knight, Orlando or Roland, completely disregards Charlemagne. We don't even have mention of Charlemagne in the cantos we read, and just goes off on his own quest to pursue this elusive princess whose uh, you know, rejection of him and choosing of another lover eventually drives him insane. So very different. Um, um, but is the character himself that different, or is the author just placed him in new and unexpected situations, situations that seem to evoke a renaissance more than the Middle Ages? So Aristo likes to reinvent past characters, and that was kind of a new thing at the time. We see that a lot in postmodern literature today. But, you know, 500 years ago, that was a much newer type of thing. So um, this certainly is maybe not a masterpiece in the way that something like Dante's Inferno or Beowulf or the Canterbury Tales might be. But it, it does very unique things that were new and revolutionary at the time. And that's why we're looking at it. <clears throat> and we'll return to um, each of these questions <coughs> as we... Uh, further into the text. Um, here we'll go a little bit further into the text. And my first question here is, describe Orlando's descent into madness. Um, this shows a de great degree of psychological depth that we haven't seen up to this point, I would say. Um, we're really getting the inside of his mind, which fits with that whole notion of interiority um, and psychology. Now, psychology is a discipline and wasn't invented until the late 19th, early 20th century. But um, in terms of just delving with, delving into and dealing with someone's inner thoughts, um, that was something that really um, has been around since the beginning of time, but kind of came to the forefront of the Renaissance. And we see that here where we have two pretty lengthy cantos devoted to just describing what happens inside Orlando's head. Um, building on that, love comes into play. The two most prominent themes in this poem, I would say, are love and desire. And love is what drives Orlando insane. And I have some quotes on the next um, slide where Aristo really intrudes on the text and comments on love and says that love is what drives Orlando insane. Um, but again, because of the comedy here, we can't always take everything that the author says at face value. So what is he really saying about love? And how does that play a role in Orlando's narrative? So two questions on Orlando's narrative, Cantos 23 and 24, where he's driven insane um, by his love for a princess who he never obtains, his desires never fulfilled. Um, so be sure to think about those more and the learning questions will relate to them. And then shifting gears just a bit to Canto 25, this is the narrative of kind of the love triangle between Fior de Spina and the two identical twins, Richard Dett and Bradamante, um, where here you have this interesting story narrated by Richard Dett, where uh, Fior de Spina encounters Bradamante because she, her hair is cut short. Fior de Spina believes she's a man, falls madly in love with her. Um, but then when Bradamante reveals her true identity of her gender, Fiora Spina realizes because of the conventions of the time that she can't be with her. And that's a very tragic moment. She's greatly depressed by that. Um, <clears throat> but Richard Dett hears about this. Richard Dett is Bradamante's twin brother. He believes Fiora Spina beautiful. And he wants to sleep with her essentially. So he goes to her claims to be his twin sister, um, but that um, this nymph he encountered and rescued, this magical nymph through her magic, transformed him from a female to a male, so now they can be together. Um, and they are for a few months before his treachery is discovered and he's kicked out of the castle. Um, <clears throat> so there's all of this gender switching here, right? Gender seems to be a much less stable thing here than anything we've seen before. And, and so this raises an interesting question. Um, does this kind of gender switching 
uphold or subvert patriarchal values, which we've, we've already talked about what those are quite a bit this quarter. Um, <clears throat> the reason I asked the question that way is um, it would seem, you know, the, that this gender switching would kind of enable more roles or a greater degree of roles for the, you know, female characters to occupy. But at the same time, they're still always bound by the traditional conceptions, right? Um, Bradamont, or excuse me, Fiordespina only falls in love with Bradamante when she believes she's a man. And when she knows she's a man, she doesn't pursue that relationship, even though she wants to. So there might be some slippage in there. And again, Richard Dett kind of uses that to manipulate Fiora Spina and, and sleep with her. But again, that's only possible when he, you know, because he's a man. So um, is this really subversive or not? Um, it's a great question. I'll be curious to hear what you think about that. Um, <clears throat> I think it can honestly go either way. <clears throat> and finally, desire is one of the main themes of the text, in addition to love. Um, <clears throat> They call it love, but usually what the, most of these characters are doing is lusting. And so there's this idea of desire that's often fulfilled or unfulfilled. We see it unfulfilled with Orlando. He goes insane. And then we see it unfulfilled with Fiora Spina, and she becomes depressed. And then we see it fulfilled for Richard Dett, but only for a short period of time. And we see Fiora Spina believes it's fulfilled. Um, because before she learns of Richard Dead's deception. And so, <clears throat> you know, she's much happier then. And again, I have quotes about from those parts on the next slide. So, you know, what is desire here? Is, is it really something that we're supposed to achieve or does it only lead to um, tragedy? And that's where the comedy and the tragedy intertwine, and that's where we ask the question. This text is very unique, but is it really subversive, or is it actually kind of supporting, you know, more traditional, more chaste values? Um, so here are the quotes uh, I mentioned. You should go into the slide without audio online and, and look at those and explore those passages further in your textbook or, or pause it and jot down the page numbers here so you can look at them. And here are the learning questions for Canvas. One thing we haven't really talked about yet is how when Orlando does descend into madness, he has um, a transformation where he becomes animal-like. Bestial is the word the textbook uses to describe, or the, excuse me, the language in the poem that describes him. So non-human. And this makes me think back to Beowulf, right? We talked about how he's fighting with those monsters, and the monsters are clearly non-human, but they have some traits that overlap with each other. And so we haven't talked about humanity as much yet during the Renaissance. And it's very interesting because humanism as a discipline is on the rise. And that's caused people to focus more on humanity rather than the afterlife. So humanity was a very central notion at the time. But you still have Orlando transforming into this non-human creature. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. <clears throat> the second question here is a return to that blending of genres. Um, and you can use that to respond to my question about love earlier. This is question is building on that. Um, ultimately, what does the poem say about love, and how does the blending of genres help convey that message? Um, further on love, compare and contrast Orlando and Richard Dett, those two stories. Um, I use Richard Dett's name there. It's really, I think, Fiora Spina is the central character there. I probably should have said it that way. Um, but they're two very different narratives, both about love and unfulfilled desire. So com compare and contrast the two, and what do we learn from it? Finally, compare and contrast Roland and Orlando, the stories in general. Obviously, there are a lot of differences. To what degree are those differences encapsulated by the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance? And then um, finally, do they have anything in common? I mean, they seem very, very different than they are. Um, but is there anything that overlaps other than, the, you know, it being the same main character, kind of same setting? So I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about those. Hopefully you enjoyed reading this scandalous text. It's certainly exciting. 
Um, <clears throat> now we're going to transition to the spiritual part of the lesson and look at the Protestant Reformation. Again, keeping in mind um, how in these texts from the Protestant Reformation, um, similar themes emerge, even though they're very different texts. Um, and I just love this graphic here. If you know history, you know that uh, <clears throat> the Protestant Reformation began when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to a door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany, his grievances against the Catholic Church. Um, and so I just love this meme that brings that, you know, 21st century hashtag nailed it um, into place because uh, <clears throat> the things that Luther was uh, taking the Catholics to task for, at least later on in his writings, are still at stake today. And so those who agree with Luther, who take a more Protestant rather than Catholic view, would say that he really did nail it in the 21st um, century use of the term in terms of encapsulating, you know, what he believed the Bible says and how that's different from how Catholics interpret it. So this is still hotly debated, and we'll see the influence of these texts. Um, we already talked about the change in spiritual views from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, but it would probably help you to review that a little bit. <clears throat> so pause, take note. Um, and then what I'll add is that, you know, the Middle Ages was very focused on the afterlife and then focused on what humans could do to grow closer to God and reach the afterlife. So um, chivalry, courtly love enabled those things. Um, Renaissance in general, people were less concerned with the afterlife, but Luther and the other Protestant reformers certainly are. But their means of getting there are much different than chivalry and courtly love. So we'll look at that. Um, and why was the Protestant Reformation a significant event? Um, we did talk about this before, so I'd ask you to kind of review your notes, but we're going to expand on it in great detail. So mark in your notes the you know, you should be listing out the reasons why the Reformation was significant, but we're going to cover those all throughout the rest of the life. <clears throat> so a lot of historical background here compared to the previous part of the lecture because the Reformation was so um, significant. It drastically changed the new European political landscape at the time. Um, it led to the development of nation states and new national churches. If you think about it, you had the Holy Roman Empire spread all throughout Europe and even some of the eastern part of the world. And that was Catholic, right? And in terms of religion, everyone answered to the Pope. So the Protestant Reformation is kind of a side effect. You know, Luther was mainly just concerned with spirituality. But uh, <clears throat> the changes he wrought were so substantial that the Reformation became influential well beyond just the spiritual realm. And in breaking with the Pope, um, it created the opportunity for much more individuality. And so you saw new nations, say, for instance, England, which was a new nation at this time, emerge, and new national churches like the Church of England that were separate from the Vatican and Rome and the Pope. <clears throat> it all began in 1517, as I just said, when the German monk Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to a door <coughs> and... Um, Wittenberg, Germany, where he lived. Um, <clears throat> and if you recall from our discussion of Dante's Inferno, the Catholic Church at the time was selling indulgences, which were basically a piece of paper that said you can go to heaven. And so other religious figures were taking advantage of people's desire to go to heaven and making money off of it by selling these pieces of paper that really meant nothing. And this absolutely outraged Luther. And most of his 95 theses were geared around that. Um, and that was as far as I was thinking went in 1517. But as we'll see in a minute, as he continued to push further, studied more, learned more, studied the Bible more, he came to believe in the doctrine of salvation uh, by grace alone, um, rather than good works, um, which was a huge contrast to what the Catholic Church believed. And if the Catholic Church were to say, accept that doctrine, which they still have to this day, it would have completely changed the landscape of the church. Um, so Luther posed this huge challenge to what had been religious thought throughout Europe for 
as long as Christianity existed over a thousand years at this point. Um, 1500 years. Um, so he had several revolutionary proposals, including, you know, s salvation through grace, um, but also clerical marriage. He was a monk and he married a nun and they had lots of kids, so he just kind of you know, disregarded the fact that the clergy weren't supposed to marry, and he thought the clergy should marry. Um, he also proposed a translation of the Bible into local languages, which was a, also a big deal because it, it decentered the power of the Pope and other religious figures and put the power that religion can wield into the hands of the everyday man or woman. <clears throat> so um, we've talked before about the difference between universal and vernacular or local language. A universal be language being something like Latin or Arabic that is spoken and used in multiple nations, um, and thus is kind of a universal language um, that people can, if they know Latin at this time or they know Arabic at this time, then they can read texts from different countries, um, which is a, a cosmopolitan kind of a thing, but at the same time, it's also kind of a an essentializing thing. And so with the Renaissance, we saw the rise of vernacular local language where text started to be written in French, English, German, Italian, Spanish, etc. And um, the Bible was just written in Latin. And that was part of the problem. The universal language was cosmopolitan in that it incorporated and included multiple nations, but it was not cosmopolitan in that it was reserved for the upper class or the elites. So um, Luther thought... He, he read the Bible and he believed that anyone could read and understand the Bible, but only a select few of the population were reading the Bible. So he thought, how does the Pope know more than the average person? Why is the Pope more entitled to understand and interpret the Bible than someone else? Some just average guy who could bring <clears throat> so much to it um, with his perspective. So, he proposed the translation of Bible into local languages. And all of these revolutionary propositions here challenged church hierarchy. <clears throat> the Pope and the Cardinals and the other people at the top of the church didn't want the average person reading the Bible because that person could potentially challenge their authority. And, and proposing all these things, Luther did. So obviously he was excommunicated in 1521, but his writings were widely circulated throughout Europe. The average person wanted to, you know, get down with what Luther, Luther was saying because he was fighting for the average person's rights here. So <clears throat> um, he was very popular, even though after 1521, he wasn't able to continue to be part of the church. And quite frankly, he probably didn't, you know, really want to be. Um, he wanted to reform the church. He didn't want to completely do away with it. Um, a lot of the major reformers came a generation after Luther, primarily headed by John Calvin. But Luther started it all and, and gave the ideas for it. So he probably would have liked to do some reform from within the church. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, he was so dissatisfied with the Pope, that the Pope and so many of the people at the top of the church were corrupt, that it doesn't seem like he minded being, you know, dismissed from the church, and he lived happily with his wife and continued to write, and his writings were continually popular and continued to help lead to change. Um, one side effect of all of this, as I mentioned, is the rise of nation states and new national churches. And so Henry VIII, for instance, in England, broke with the Catholic Church and created the Church of England with the help of his advisors, and that was basically Catholicism with divorce for the nobility and the royalty. Um, Philip II declared himself defender of the faith. He was the king of Spain. And he's just a couple of examples. Um, and, and certainly Luther wouldn't have wanted to empower men like Henry VIII and Philip II. But if you break with the Pope, when the Pope is, you know, the ruling figure for religion all throughout Europe, that's so significant that it's going to enable other people with very different motives from Luther to also break with the Pope. Um, and, and while some of those rulers may be corrupt or not great rulers, at the same time, the emergence of nation states was a good thing um, <clears throat> because it allowed for the flourishing of a variety of cultures. And so, I mean, you know, today our world is obviously defined by 
nation states. And so you can start to see how the Protestant Reformation was so influential. Um, and, you know, now it would be easy to look back on the Reformation and, and see the ideas Luther's putting forward here as kind of outdated or just associating them with religion. And in the 21st century, religion is seen as a very kind of stodgy, stuffy thing. Um, <clears throat> but these were absolutely radical ideas at the time. The idea that someone was saved and not condemned to hell because of Jesus' sacrifice and not anything they did as a human being, that was a brand new idea that no one had ever heard before. And it sent shockwaves throughout the church, throughout Europe. So um, it's very radical. And the Renaissance was a time filled with you know radical challenges to traditional forms of thought. And even though... Today, Luther's ideas probably seem like traditional forms of thought. They were not at the time. And that's important to keep in mind as we continue to study the Reformation. Um, <clears throat> so we have two types of texts. <coughs> um, poems and prose. We're reading Luther and then another uh, prose text. Um, and then we're reading some poetry. Um, John Donne is one of the greatest poets of all time. I, I would say Dunn is probably um, the greatest poet of all time outside of Rumi, in my personal preference, my personal opinion. And although his religious poems are not necessarily as complex or as interesting as his love poems he wrote to his wife, um, he still um, they still show complexity and depth of thought and great points about religion that really tie into the Reformation. So... Um, Obviously, one of your options for studying the text this week is to do the paraphrasing of the short lyric poetry like we've done in the past with Ruby and with the Renaissance sonnets. Um, if you choose to look at the prose text, I ask you to think about these revolutionary ideas we just talked about that Luther put forth and how they show up in these texts and maybe additional ones that also show up. And you can certainly think about that with the poems, too. Um, so here are the steps for interpreting short lyric poetry. You should be familiar with these from our other two lessons on short lyric poetry. So I'm going to quickly jump to the next slide. But if you're not, you know, you can certainly pause this or go back and review it by opening slides without audio on Canva. Um, <clears throat> what is Luther's main argument? Uh, what strategies does he use to persuade readers? I would say that... Um, Luther's argument is salvation through grace rather than works. And if that's true, then any person can be saved, which means any person should be able to read the Bible. And he, he basically puts the Pope and everyone else in the entire world on a level playing field and says the Bible should be for everyone. And he does this by looking at Scripture. He quotes Scripture quite a bit. And he tries to say that, you know, the Pope and other religious leaders, what they're, they're building their hierarchy, their church hierarchy on, is not um, necessarily biblical, not necessarily in the scriptures. So he often used the phrase sola scriptura, solely scripture or scripture alone. And so he's saying, if you just look at the Bible, if you just look at what it says, it says everyone should be able to read it, not just the Pope. Um, and so, um, well... To someone like the Pope, that may not be an effective strategy. I think we can see today kind of the, you know, the sheer truth of, you know, what he's getting at. Even, and I should mention here, um, even if you're not religious, even if you're Catholic, even if you're Protestant, um, whatever, whatever you believe, you know, whether you're an atheist, I think we can see um, in the context of a time where these people were living in countries where Christianity was a national religion, why Luther was a revolutionary figure and why he'd also be seen as a heroic figure. I would say even the Catholics to this day. And you might quibble with me here. Um, but certainly, you know, everyone should be allowed to read the Bible. And that's, you know, what he was fighting for. And what better evidence for that than what it says in the Bible itself. So whatever you believe, it's, it's hard to argue with those things. And that's why um, we're studying this text even though we're, you know, not at a Christian university. So it's it's significant to Western culture for these reasons, whatever your beliefs. And I don't mean to be trying to push any kind of beliefs on you at all, just trying to show you 
when, how, and why a certain text was influential throughout history. The other prose text we have is Tara Body, uh, which is very interesting because she, her whole argument is that women should not be placed in convents against their will. And convents at this time were um, um, used as a means to confine women, almost imprison them in this very patriarchal culture. And she again has an effective strategy like Dunn where she goes – excuse me, like Luther, where she goes to the scriptures and she says, you know, she's not challenging religion here. She's just challenging one of the ways that religion is abused by authoritarian figures. She's saying, if someone really believes in God and lives out a godly life, that's great. But if you force someone into a convent against their will, that's not good. And it's essentially a prison. So, you know, very interesting kind of pre-feminist argument, but one that still draws on religion. And religion is often cited as, you know, a kind of, patriarchal or anti-feminist thing. And, and you have Terabati making a very feminist argument here by using scripture. And, and so I think it's interesting to revisit her works for that reason. Um, the next couple of questions have to do with Dunn's sonnets. Um, one on each sonnet that we have here. Um, the other poet we're looking at, St. John of the Cross, I really only have one question about his poems. So that will show up on um, the learning questions in a minute. Um, but Dunn's sonnets are much more complex, so I wanted to give you some little bit of questions, a little bit of my response to questions here to help you grapple with those. Um, remember everything from the last lecture about sonnets? Um, Dunn's applying the same principles and structures here, but talking about his relationship with God rather than with a, a beloved. Um, so in this first sonnet, I think you can really see um, sonnet for the doctrine of, you know, justification or salvation through grace rather than works. Um, really in, in all of these, but especially the first one and the last one here. And he uses specific colors, you know, the blood, the black soul versus the blood to, to make that point. Um, Don also uses a concept called a consi, which is a really cool poetical device that made him famous after his lifetime and is why his poetry is still studied today, because it's so hard to do, it's so technical, technically complex, and he does such an amazing job with it. And if you ever have time to read his longer poems that aren't sonnets, that are love poems he wrote to his wife, you really see the consi at work, and it's just amazing. But a consi is an extended metaphor. And a metaphor is where you compare dissimilar things, two things that aren't similar, but you say that they're alike to make a point. Um, like saying it's as hot as a sauna in here, even if you're not literally in a sauna. Um, um, but it's usually just a quick reference, like the one I just made. A conceit is where you extend the metaphor through the entire poem. So whatever you're comparing something to, it takes on the properties of that thing and it maintains those all throughout. To give you a couple of examples, in Dunn's uh, love poetry to his wife, he has um, a poem called Valediction Forbidding Morning, where he's going out of town for work. He was a, a preacher, and he tells his wife, um, don't be sad that I'm leaving because we are joined and we'll never really be apart. We're so joined together. And he compares it to their love to one of those compasses where um, – uh, a dual compass you can use for drawing where you put it in the middle of the paper then extend out the other leg and draw the circle and so he's the other leg going out into the world but he's always attached to the one that stays rooted at the center and will come back there and so he does the same type of thing in Holy Sonnet 5 where he compares himself to the world and as he describes himself you know as the world he as if he were a planet, he carries that through the entire poem, which is what's so amazing about it, just like the compass poem. Um, and, and if you think about um, the Bible, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but one piece of important background here is that um, in Revelation, when it talks about heaven, the only description of heaven in the Bible, it says that God will eventually destroy um, the current heavens and the earth and replace them with new heavens and a new earth. And essentially there will be a new version of Garden of Eden, and that's what people will live in. And so uh, 
because for in Christian doctrine the world is corrupt and fallen, that's why that needs to happen for Christians. And so Dunn's saying here he's like the world. He's so flawed as a human, he needs the love of Jesus and he needs to be destroyed and kind of reborn again in order to to be cleansed and be pure and be free of sin. Um, the final one here, Holy Son at 14, is certainly the most famous of uh, Dunn's Holy Sonnets, other than Holy Sonnet 10, Death Be Not Proud, which is in our textbook, and I wish it were, but Holy Sonnet 4 is the second most famous of his Holy Sonnets, and definitely the most famous of the ones we have in our textbook. And so um, here he's basically asking the triune God, um, and that's an important part of it, um, the Trinity here. Um, you know, some Christians don't believe, Unitarian Christians don't believe in the Trinity. So um, that's kind of a important part of it that um, could have been controversial in some circles. But what's really interesting about this poem is the carnal language. Um, Don often used um, a very carnal, lustful language in a loving way, though, describing his relationship with his wife. He was very passionate about his wife and his other poems. And so critics tend to look at this poem, and when they when he says, batter me, three-person God, you know, ravish me, they tend to look at it as, as done kind of blurring his sexual um, language. He's used in other types of poems with his religious, spiritual language he uses in these holy sonnets. And a lot of critics say that can't be, really be reconciled. It has to do with who Dunn was as a person. Um, but I disagree. In, in my interpretation, this poem is a little out there, so you certainly don't have to buy into it. Uh, but I'd like to offer it to you. And there's two. One is that, you know, Dunn sees himself as a flawed sinner who can't, you know, um, overcome his sin without the love of Jesus. And so... You know, that's why a language like this might make it into the poem. But at the same time, I think it even goes beyond that. Um, I think it really comes back to Luther's idea of salvation by grace rather than works. And the reason Dunn is telling God to ravish him here is he's saying he can't do this without God. He can't overcome his sin without God. He needs God. And so he just wants God to take complete control of him. And while that may seem hard to reconcile because of all of the kind of sexual language here, at the same time, it really does connect with Luther's doctrine of salvation by grace. So I don't know. And it connects with that because he's saying he entirely needs God's help. He can't do it on his own. He needs God to just take control of him, ravish him here. And so I don't know what other people think. A lot of people probably don't see that connection to Luther, but I, I do see it here, and I think it explains the paradox of how can he have God ravish him and be chased? Well, he's not chased because he's a sinner. He can only overcome the sin if God just completely takes over. And so he's saying, ravish me so that I can be chased. It makes sense if you think about it in light of Luther's um, introduction of <clears throat> salvation by grace but um you know other critics like to just see it as a guy who liked to talk about sex in his other poems trying to write holy songs um, but i think it goes beyond that and, and but you can take it either way so i'd love to hear your interpretations again um here are some really important passages from uh, luther and tarabati and then of course the poems are so short uh, for close reading i would say read them in entirety like we talked about on the close reading slides earlier. For learning questions for Canvas, again, whenever we do um, <clears throat> short lyric poetry, and this will be the third and final time, you can just put up your paraphrase of the poem, as long as it's 250 words. Um, but if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to paraphrase a poem line by line, you could also try to answer one of the following questions. Um, again, Coming back to that idea of salvation through grace, why would that be radical at the time? Or any of the other ideas Luther introduced, why would they be radical? Um, how does Tarabadi use her um, spiritual concepts to make her argument? How does she tie her argument to Christianity, religion, spirituality, right? 
Christianity is often seen as a patriarchal thing. At the time, it was often used that way. But she's trying to challenge it and say, no, it shouldn't be used that way. Just like Luther, she's saying, people who are abusing Christianity at the time have misinterpreted it. If we go back and look what the Bible says, we'll get a different view, a less patriarchal view or a view that leads to less corruption in the church in Luther's case. So how are her strategies similar to Luther's? Um, we haven't talked about San Juan de la Cruz, who's better known as St. John of the Cross yet. Um, but his short poems, it sounds like he's having a love affair with God, um, which seems odd. So why would he use that language is the question. Um, also, Dunn's theology. Now that you've read three of his poems, how would you define, describe his theology in his own words? And, and to do a full post here, you probably want to quote from the poems and I Explain it. What is Dunn's theology? How would you describe it in your words? Um, finally, that question that has guided this whole lesson. We looked at Orlando Furioso. We've looked at some spiritual texts that are very different. Do they have any similarities? Um, and even if you don't think they do, which is fine, um, how do they both reflect themes and values of the Renaissance? They're both radical. And the Renaissance was all about doing something new and revolutionary and radical. Um, but they're radical in different ways. So you at least outline those. But if you do see any similarities, I think that'd be fascinating. I'd love to hear those. So hopefully you enjoyed these readings. I know not everyone may enjoy religious texts. Um, and I certainly understand why. But at the same time, these were highly influential texts that I think no matter what you believe, have some really interesting ideas that are at least worth exploring from a philosophical standpoint. So I've enjoyed talking with you. I look forward to reading your posts, and I hope you enjoyed the readings for this lesson. Have a great day.